All right, so the purpose of this video is to talk about elastic or spring potential energy. But first, let's remind ourselves of what Hooke's law is. So here we have a ball attached to a spring that is moving to the right as indicated by the velocity that you can see here. And it is being acted on by the spring to the left, which comes from that force right there. Now, the relaxed length of the spring is in the middle. That's where the spring normally would be. So if you can imagine, this ball is moving to the right while the spring pulls back on it because it's being stretched past its relaxed length. For the equation to describe the force that's in this spring, we would use Hooke's law, which is simply the spring constant times the change of position or, or how stretched the, the spring is from its relaxed length. When we talk about work that's being done by springs, we actually have to talk um, about a force in the spring that's changing. So what we do to, to do that without calculus is we define the average force of the spring as being the force in the spring at some final position plus the force in the spring at some initial position, noted by Fs0. And then we divide that by 2, just like you would do with a normal average. You add two things together and then divide by 2. Okay, so with this average spring force, or F savage, we're going to figure out what the work being done by the spring is in this situation right here. Now, keep in mind that in this situation, the object should be slowing down because the spring force is acting against the velocity, therefore reducing it as it moves forward. So let's start with our general work equation where we take the average spring force um, and then we multiply it by the change of position. But again, we have to plug in our average spring force as the two spring forces um, divided by two, then multiply that by delta x. Now, what I'm gonna do here is a couple of things. First, I'm going to plug in kx for each um, spring force, and then I'm gonna expand delta x. And I'm also gonna factor out the one half so I can kind of see what's happening with these two middle terms right here. If I take these two terms and I do a first, inner, outer, last, right, or a foil, then what I'm going to get is a series of four terms. Now, the four terms that you're going to get are these. And you'll notice that when you factor out, or, you, or I guess not factor out, distribute all the things inside of these parentheses, that you're going to have two things that cancel, right here and right here. So these terms are going to cancel each other out. And what you're left with is kx squared minus kx naught squared. I'm going to reverse those and then factor the one-halves back in. Okay, so now we have one-half kx squared minus one-half kx naught squared. You'll notice that each of these things is a snapshot of what's happening at the end with the x squared and what's happening um, in the beginning with the x naught squared. We call each of these a spring potential energy or a US. We call the one US for the final spring potential and US naught or USO for the initial spring potential. Um, and as you can see, since you've got US minus USO, we've got delta US or what this essentially is telling us is that work done by the spring is equal to a negative change in the potential of that spring. Now that makes sense because when this spring does positive work, slowing this ball or speeding this ball up, that means that the potential in the spring is going to go away because the spring itself is becoming unstretched and therefore losing its potential. Now, let's take a look at what this looks like with calculus. With calculus, we are gonna go through the exact same process except now we're going to integrate the force of the spring times all of the little positions. Um, but rather than use r, which is our general position variable, we're gonna use x instead. And I'm gonna integrate from some position x to x naught. So when I plugged in kx here for the spring force uh, and I take the integral of that, it's just like if I had y equals, I don't know, let's say 2x dx and then I integrate that to get an integral, I'm going to get the integral of 2x dx. I raise x to the power of 2 um, and then I'm going to divide by that new power and so I would get x squared you know, plus C, or if I evaluated it from some, I don't know, let's say X naught to X, then I would evaluate that X to X naught, and it would be X squared minus X naught squared. Okay, but in this case, what I'm gonna be doing is keeping the X as a constant. So it goes outside of the integral. And then I raise X to the power of two, and I divide by one half. 
Now, simplifying that, I get negative k, you know, over one half times x squared. Now, I still need to evaluate that from x to x naught, and what I'm going to get is one half kx squared minus one half kx naught squared, which is exactly what we had before. The two spring potentials giving us that the positive work done by the spring is equal to a negative change in the potential energy. All right, so really the goal of this derivation is to show us that we now have a new potential energy that's present in a spring, the a spring's elastic potential energy. Remember, we use the word elastic because elastic is a word that describes how something, um, how able an object is to return to its original shape. Things like springs are elastic because they can stretch and return to their original shape. Things like clay are plastic because they can stretch, but they won't return to their original shapes. All right, let's see how this looks in an example problem. Here I have an archer pulling the string on their bow back a distance 70 centimeters from the equilibrium that should say position. Um, and then we hold the string at this position with a force of 140 newtons and the amount of elastic potential energy stored in the bow is what we're looking for. So let's think about this for a second. Here's you, you're really excited, you're holding a bow string and you are holding this, right? You got the arrow, fantastic, having a great day, yay. Now, the amount of force that it takes for you to pull back on this bowstring, we'll call that F, is 140 newtons. Now, the force in the spring, which in this case is the strings, is just going to be exactly equal to that. Call that Fs. Okay, so the force in the spring for this problem is 140 newtons. Knowing that the string has been pulled back, a displacement sorry, uh, a displacement of 70 centimeters, um, or we can call that x, and that would be 0.7 meters. Knowing that it's been pulled back, we can actually figure out what k is because we know that um, the spring force is equal to negative kx. And really we would call this a negative spring force, um, or we can just use the magnitudes to compare them. But the spring constant, k, is going to be the force of the spring divided by that stretch, 0.7 meters. And the force of the spring is 140 newtons. Okay, so we get 140 divided by 0.7, which gives us 200 newtons per meter for the spring constant. Okay, so that's the spring constant, k. To figure out the elastic potential energy, then, we just need one half of k x squared. So half of k, 200 newtons per meter, times the amount that stretched, 0.7 meters squared, is going to be 100 times 0.7 squared, which is 0.49, giving us a total of 49 joules. So that's the potential that's stored in the bow. All right, for this next problem, let's take a look at Rod Kimball, who rides his moped down a steep hill. The hill is 80 meters tall. Rod starts not from rest, but inside of a spring-loaded cannon. Um, and the compressed spring, 1.2 meters, has a constant of 240 newtons per meter. So I'm going to draw this situation. And here's the spring-loaded cannon. Rod is inside of it. Let's represent Rod as almost like a pinball, maybe, something like that. Okay, so... You are asked to figure out what will the velocity of Rod be when he goes off of a ramp that's at a height of 10 meters. So here I have the ground at 0 meters, the ramp at 10 meters, and then the top of the hill is going to be 80 meters. And we want to figure out what's the speed right as Rod goes off of the ramp. On a model, Rod is like a, a little small ball. So we want to figure out what that velocity is. All right, so what we're going to do is take an energy analysis approach to this, where the energy in the beginning is equal to the energy at the end. So all I have to do is identify the energies in the beginning and the energies that are at the end. Now, initially, what I should have is potential energy um, from the force of gravity acting down, but then also now I'm going to have potential energy in the spring. Okay, then at the end, I'm going to have kinetic energy because of the velocity that I'm looking for, but also because I'm at a height of 10 meters, I should say that I have some potential energy at the end. Of course, remember that potential energy is a relative concept. depends on where you would like the ground to be. So if I instead said that the top of the ramp was zero and change all of these positions relative to that fact, 
then I can go ahead and say that at the top of the ramp, there is no potential energy. And I'm left with this equation right here. Okay, so now I know that the potential energy in the beginning can be written as mgy0 plus 1 half k. Um, in this case, the distance x, I'll call that x squared. And this is equal to 1 half mass times the velocity squared. All right, now to solve for the velocity, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 and then divide by the mass. The last thing that I'm going to end up doing is uh, taking the square root of both sides. Um, I can do some simplifications. It's not that big of a deal. If I wanted to rearrange this, I would cross out the mass for that term, um, but not for this second term. What I would actually get is 2g y naught plus um, the 2 times the 1 half cancels. Uh, kx squared over m equals v squared, and then I take the square root. All right, so finding the velocity, we would do 2 times, we'll use 10 for the acceleration due to gravity, meters per second squared. Um, the initial height that I use is 70 meters. And then for uh, kx squared, I'm going to do plus my k term is 240. My x term is 1.2. And my term on the bottom for m is 70 kilograms. All right, now when I plug all of this into my calculator, what I'm going to get is 37.48. So we'll call that 37. 0.5 meters per second. Great. That's Rod's final velocity.